Hello everyone and welcome to the first Think Piece edition. So I'll be covering the very first Think Piece I ever wrote, which compared to the ones I am currently producing is far cry from where I'm at. So bear with me when uh, we journey into the past of what Think Piece was. But you know what they say, everything has to have a start. So let's get down right to the bare bones of this guy. Guys, introducing the newest addition to the group is my weekly newsletter, The Think Piece. It's literally a combination of everything I want to write about, everything I want to mention, and just literally any topic that comes to mind that I want to write about. So, you know, you could use this for everything from daily information to, uh, you know, using cool facts that you can convince your buddies, like, hey, let's make a bet and get free beers out of it. That was the idea, anyway. And also in this one, I release exclusive articles to the newsletter that only people who subscribe to it get it. And one thing is certain, this is always an organic newsletter. It changes constantly, and there's always something new, regardless if you want to know it or not. But, with that said, you should not miss out. And you should always be informed, kept up to date with what's going on, and if not, then what are you really doing anyway? So, that was the shorthand for this podcast, and also for this think piece in particular. Short, brief, but it got to the point. And considering I really had no idea where I was going in the beginning, it was a good idea to just kind of lay out what I was trying to go for. But the next section is literally called the bookshelf, which is all the book reviews I had done up to that point on my website, which I had done quite a few of. I mean, originally the idea was I was going to write book reviews, which I still do occasionally, but nowhere near to the same level I was doing then. I was also reading, during the pandemic, easily a book a week. So roughly, I would say around 300 to 400 page books, until I was like, oh man, I'm going to be ambitious and I'm going to take on some heavier books. And then what happened? I said, this thousand page book is going to be easy. I can do it in a week. What happened? Did not happen. (laughs) That's literally how that went by. But speaking of which, there are some of these book reviews that I had done before, like I mentioned, and um, I'm going to add the links to these specific ones that I'm talking about here. But for your information, I will be adding some extra little tidbits. So the first book literally is Dune Messiah, which comes from the trilogy, which actually I think it's about four or five more books total of the Dune series, which starts off with the original book, the first one in the series, Dune itself. The second book is literally a compilation that follows the path of Paul Andreas, Andreas. And he's literally like, it's covering his rule, his absence, and everything in between. Because the whole series is just a, how would you say, it's obviously a fiction-based story. But the literature is, it's easy to read, but sometimes it could get dry. I remember reading this book and I really got stuck at parts, and it just was not a force to be reckoned with. Now, the first one is excellent. first one is engaging, it's quite intriguing, and it's just a overall excellent read to just sink your teeth into science fiction novels. The second one, like I said, it was really tough at some parts, and it really was just a... It was just overall hard to finish and I didn't have the incentive to really commit to it but I did force myself to get through it and I did finish it but in the end I mean I'd give it a 5 out of 10 honestly I mean it's for the for the continuation of the story and knowing some conclusions and actually concluding the series yes I absolutely recommend people to read it but if you know 
if you're good with just reading the first book and not really knowing what happens and just concluding that it ends there, I would, I would probably recommend that. But if you're like me, perfectionist, you wanted to see the very end, you wanted to know exactly what's happening, then you have to read the second book, Dune Messiah, which I'll actually put the full review down below. My pen rye means never mind. Now, my buddy, he gave me this book after I had returned back from Thailand, and he had read it several decades, actually a few decades ago, before I, we ever were friends and that, and he constantly always recommended this book. Until finally, he, as a gift, he was like, you know what, here, I'm going to get this book, you need to read it. And so I did. You know, if somebody gifts me a book, I can't just not read it now. And uh, I read it, and it was quite an intriguing little story. And it's based off of a American who American housewife who lives in Bangkok during the 50s and 60s. And she also is a teacher at one of their universities. And she just has this love affair with the whole culture. She just gets immersed into it. And her husband works in the... Uh, State Department, and so he's been transferred there, and her daughter comes along with them because they're living over there. And several of the stories are quite funny, and also it's quite interesting to see, or at the time read about, you know, the process there. It's a good look into the past, as well as, you know, seeing the culture, how, how strikingly different the mentality was, where they had, I remember one section in this story that talks about the different lifestyles and how drastically, you know, different the cultures were, where she's so accustomed to having a kitchen that's Americanized with appliances galore, refrigeration, you know, the nine yards, because in the 50s and 60s, America was really pushing that, you know, nuclear family where, you know, you have the mom that stays home, takes care of the kids, cooks and all that, but now she in Thailand, or in Bangkok specifically, had uh, servants, you know, and literally the whole process was just wildly different from her explanations. Like, she even explains it at one point when she goes into the kitchen, because they, they are cooking everything in their kitchen, and she's, like, trying to learn how to make just the basic I think it was a grilled cheese or something so simple in America that she just could not figure out how to make lunch at all because I think some of the servants were gone and it was just wild. And <laughs> her explanations on how she did things and how she was trying to learn how to cook with everything there, it was just, it was interesting. The whole story was quite delightful, quite serene and just surreal at the same time. And... It really harked back to some of my experiences in Thailand, which actually has changed significantly from what I was reading in this, where, you know, Thailand has caught, has, uh, caught up a lot with the uh, Western mentality of what modernity is and what we consider modernity, which, I mean, I love the charm and the authenticity of Thailand overall. So it was like, I love the blendings and the mismatches and just the hodgepodge of, you know, modern buildings with these shanties or shacks or just these odd cultural buildings or even just the random street ver uh, mer merchants in front and vendors and you know you're jumping on the back of these tuk-tuks that are just haphazardly like a half cut off motorcycle with a back of a truck trailer on it and it's just, it's just such a whirlwind of just everything blending either blending very well or just a hodgepodge of it and the book really really sunk into that even if it is dated and it does have some references that are kind of it doesn't fit in today's narrative of what we expect to triggers me you know it's not so much like explaining like a vlog or a blog or where they're just like oh well this is how you do this and it's real mechanical it's real you know a to-do list or this list or explaining stuff. It is really more like story times and you just, you were living the story that she was telling you and you were living in her view, in her eyes, seeing it through her eyes and her experiences. And that was just probably my favorite part of the book. So I highly, highly recommend it. If you like Thailand or like travel books or just, just want a 
somewhat antiquated view or dated view of a culture this this book is absolutely a must it's a great little you know it's barely 100 pages i think it's a little bit more than that maybe 130 pages but it's it's such an easy read and just it's it's just delightful it's a i can't recommend it enough obviously so that was the bookshelf which covered just two books at the time covering my uh science fiction enjoyments and also my uh non-fiction favorite next we have the good the bad and the unsavory which if you know me that last word is one of my favorite words to use in most scenarios because i mean it's not bad it's not good but it's just not to the taste buds it's just not savory enough but this was my attempt at first to really, really delve into um, what we do consider news articles, stuff that nobody really thinks about or even looks at, or things I believe people should know and should consider knowing. So I tried to make it very light so you could, if you wanted to read the article, you could go and see the full article, but I wanted you to get the kernel of knowledge that you needed from the article. Now these were just sentence long, so they were very short compared to what I was writing. <laughs> I think it was a week ago <laughs> where I'm writing full on paragraphs and almost two or three paragraphs per section about subjects and it's like I'm explaining the full details. I'm getting as long as the articles and I'm not keeping it as short, but these were really short. So what I'll do is flesh them out a little bit more so then I, I remember the articles. I'm like looking at them right now and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember what that article was talking about. And it's like, is there something wrong with me? I don't know. It could be. But needless to say, it's this one covers the $1 trillion for European and U.S. companies to relocate from China. So this started back... It was in, uh, I believe the first one is in August the 28th, so it was still in the Trump administration where they were pushing for punitive tariffs on China and all Chinese goods. And the discussion, which was actually happening at the time, a big chunk of U.S. and European companies were avoiding the extra tariffs that were, tariffs are essentially taxes added to products that are imported from another country that they put them on. So when people are like, oh, free trade, free trade, you know, or tariffs protect industries. Well, free trade just means there's no taxes on the goods or there's so little taxes that it's pretty much like a free trading. And where tariffs come in, that's literally just a tax put on the something. So then it will it will encourage companies not to purchase from a country, said country that has the tariffs on it, and it'll encourage them to go to the cheapest, lower, or low tax areas. It's kind of the best way to encourage companies to do business with who you want them to do as a nation. So with that said, the U.S. was, U.S. and European countries were looking at spending almost a trillion dollars collectively to just literally move their operations from China and most of the manufacturing hubs in China to other countries, which reality was it a good portion of them did. I remember specifically Apple was one of the biggest ones that moved, I think, roughly around 20 to 30 percent of their manufacturing operations from China to specifically Vietnam. I don't know if I wrote about it, but I probably did in a later episode. But they specifically moved between 20 to 30 percent of all their operations from China to Vietnam to specifically avoid the tariffs on uh, their products because, I mean, it's Apple. Everyone wants an iPhone. Everyone wants the latest Mac. So, you know, they got to find the best way to squeeze out the majority of their profit from anywhere they can. And so that's what they did. And they were discussing how much would this affect businesses? How much would it cost them? Was it justified to just simply eat the tax, the tariff tax that was going to be put on them? Or was it better to move to a new country and start doing business elsewhere? And the figure they estimated at this period of time was $1 trillion for all the companies. So think about U.S. and European companies like Google, um, who else? Apple, obviously, I mentioned. Any of your manufacturing companies, any of your cell phone companies, 
like Nokia would be a European one that would be relocated considering because China is your big manufacturer. Obviously, they create your circuit boards and they build this stuff. They don't actually design the technology there. The technology is pretty much handled in Western affairs, but like your phone screens, your phone circuit boards, your lithium batteries, your casings, everything of that nature is built there. And then the chips, the, the semiconductors and all those are implanted in a different place or probably in the homeland country because those are specialty technologies that are held secretive. Like they, they can't release that information or they will not because those are trade secrets. So thus, the grand scheme was looking at the cost of moving everything, and that's what they ended up coming up to in that story. Moving on from that is the U.S. has taken, at this time, a tougher stance in the South China Sea. And I would examine how the Southeast Asia, na Asian nations will benefit from it, which is extremely true if you think about it. These nations, which are specifically focusing on, I believe it was Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, well, not so much Laos, but any nation that was harboring on or connected to or adjacent to the Southeast China Sea, which is predominantly Vietnam, um, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia, which all have some form or a claim to the Southeast China Sea. And so they are all belligerence in this now where it comes to them benefiting this you so you have the chinese who are really aggressive really pushing their claim that they control the entirety of this sea which i mean that opens its own can of worms if that's justified or not but for the case of this they individually cannot stand up against China. China's GDP alone is just gargantuan. Their capacity, their economy is just mammoth. Even if these countries could look up past their own personal differences between one another, like in ASEAN, like they just, they're too competitive. They're too used to each other being rivals to look past their differences and join together to unite against China. If they did, it would be, it would be, imagine the EU, and that's exactly what you have in these nations, but they won't do that. They're not going to do that. They're, honestly, they're very, very, how would you say, they just look at each other with not cautionary eyes. They're looking at each other like immediacy of rivals. But where this benefits them, though, in the grand scheme is with U.S. as a big Super, as a superpower, obviously, in the region and a big regional actor, their influence challenges the Chinese influence. So what these guys could and can do and how they can benefit from it is neither really siding with one or the, uh, over the other. It's more or less playing the fence and, you know, getting one begrudging to play on to the other and benefiting from that scenario, which is really hard. Because, you know, it's really hard to stay on one side or the other or really try to balance them out because each side is wanting you to join them, wanting you to side with them. And so a lot of the benefits that they offer you will depend on if you're with them or against them. And so the balancing act is tough. And I talk about it in here where... If the U.S. just exits the Pacific region, then these countries will be at the mercy. If they don't collectively work together, they will be at the mercy of China for these countries as a counterweight, as a countermeasure to give them some political pull because, honestly, they wouldn't. And as a small nation or a medium nation knows, you have to be able to play the politic game in order to you know, levy your goals and wants and get your claims. Next thing is something called seed steading. So I remember reading this article. It was kind of bizarre, but these people 
have convinced others to move out into the ocean. And they did this in Thailand. I remember reading it. And they are trying to live off the grid, trying to live off of the fruits of the land and away from everything. And so what they do is instead of going to like homesteading, which is homesteading is going out into the wilderness, getting off the grid, building your little hut and living off the fruits of the land. These people decided to go out to the sea. And so they, they went out into the Gulf of Thailand and the Thai government ended up like pushing them out and rushing them out. And they were like, well, this is our right to free range here. And they're like, the Thai government was like, no, you can't do this. So they tried to just literally live off the fat of the land and live off the grid out in the Gulf of Thailand. And they got funding because other people were like looking into this and they were like, hey, if you guys can do this and figure out a really sustainable way to do it, you know, we want to we want to end on it. And so the story goes that it was I believe it was an American and a Thai woman were doing this with all the money, seed, all the investment money. And the Thai government just chased them out. Like the Coast Guard came there and was just like, hey, you guys can't be there. And they ran away without being caught. And it's pretty much a wild story. It just is ridiculous. And I was just like, what in, what in the world are people thinking? Or if they are thinking at all. I mean, I think it's an interesting idea. And I think it's quite novel. Because it does go on to previous stories where, like the concept, I don't know if my viewers have thought of or heard of Atlantis which was this mega city out in the sea and it's 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 a wild construct to think of building cities out in the sea in the international waters where they themselves are like city states living out in the water and they're big trade hubs which is I mean it's a cool idea it's it's gotten a lot of credit before but now it's just like, is it plausible? I mean, I think it's more, I think it's no more or no less plausible than say you have a moon city or a space colony or a, like an international space station where you have this, you know, it's out in the middle of space orbiting the planet and it's in international space. So guess what? Anybody can live there or anybody can go there. But these are, this is, the station is held by governments and stuff. Well, this is, you know, same construct could happen. It's an interesting idea, and it's really cool to get for science fiction stories, but practically, or in practicality, I don't know. I mean, it's plausible. It's fun to look at. But the next one, the next section, Around the World. Now, this one, again, covers my articles, which are actually focused this time on my travels. So when I was in, when I travel places, I tend to keep a journal and I can't tend to write stories about experiences I've had or places I've been to and things I see and experience. In this one, I talk about the Ho Chi Minh Ale Trail, which is actually a thing that covers like, I think it's about 10 breweries that exist in Ho Chi Minh City alone. And they do exist elsewhere in Vietnam, but these are homegrown breweries where Vietnamese beer is made in these places. And so they actually created this program called the, literally, Ho Chi Minh Ale Trail, where you get this little pamphlet and you go around to these breweries and get little stamps and stuff. And at the very end of it, once you've been to them all, you get like a shirt or a mug or something other or growlers whatnot but uh it's this is something that a lot of your local breweries are banding together to create interest and create some form of promotion that doesn't cost them a whole lot of money but also like for beer connoisseurs this is this is delightful because you get this list of all these breweries and if you're like me which most people should be i love tasting new brews and i love tasting local beers and i just it's just fantastic to go and see what concoctions people come up with and what ideas they have for flavors for you know all these sort of mouthfeels you can get and so this whole list here i write about i talk about this each i believe i talk about five total in them and i'm not going to spoil it for you because i think you should read it I think it's a good one, especially if you like beer. I give you some good listings on some beer tastes and 
I also have an under tap and uh, untap, excuse me, not under tap. And it's quite tasty. And it's just, it's just fun, you know, to go and try these new beers and, you know, have something to talk about. And it's just a great experience. It's a fun little get together. You do it with friends and get flights and stuff. And ultimately, that's what I did. I do it in a lot of places. So that is around the, around the world with the Ho Chi Minh Ale Trail. The next one was the Grand Palace Complex in Bangkok, Thailand. Now this place is ridiculously big. All the Mon Thai monarchs have been building this place since they moved the capital of Thailand to Bangkok proper. And each king has added an extra place into it, added a palace, added a wing and stuff. And the place is literally 218,400 square meters, or in English terms, it's, or imperial measurement, is 2,351,000 square foot. It's surrounded by a wall, four walls, mega walls, and literally it's just this me mammoth complex where the kings of Thailand used to live and they had their own private little world inside of their country. And it's really interesting to go looking into these places and seeing all the decor, the lavish like furniture, the just, it's mind boggling to think. Or it's just an expression of how much power these monarchs had. And you can see it in the architecture, you can see it in their luxuries. It was a show of the power that these individuals wielded over millions of people and what they could do with that be it make more statues be it extending the palace or making it more glamorous or just all breathtaking but it's, it's it is a symbol and that's what it was a symbol of their power and their might over the world that they controlled which was thailand in this time and it's probably one of my favorite places to visit, even though it's, at the time, it was extremely hot. And when I was checking out the place, and I remember sweating bullets. And you have to wear pants and cover your shoulders, because, I mean, these are, a lot of these are, like, are temples, Buddhist temples, so you have to respect them. And so, that's fine. It's just, it's hot. And I remember walking through all these, and it's just, it was hot. <laughs> but it was just breathtaking and just all inspiring to see all these structures the murals on the inside just these paintings galore and people praying and just all these statues of buddha and it's 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 quite it's elaborate that's for sure and i highly recommend anybody that ever travels there like i talked in my article to go there check it out and for sure write about it and at least take a picture of it now this is the one where it gets a bit longer because this is the actual first exclusive article that I write for the newsletter. It's out now, so you can read it anywhere in my website. But this is the first one that's exclusive for the newsletter itself specifically. It's capped called Adventure, Escape, or Instagram Caption. So when we hear people mentioning travel going on an adventure or striking it out in a big way. It's a subject for me that's close to home because I myself travel a lot and I venture all over the world, or I try to anyway. And sometimes I see people putting it on Instagram, like, look at me, I'm traveling, I'm, I'm doing this and that. And I always wondered, like, do you, do you really go do you go for it because you want the adventure itself or do you just want these photos do you want to experience something other than the life that you live or are you trying to understand a new culture are you trying to embrace something new a new lifestyle a new mental change a new environment or are you just just going out here because you're instagram because you're going to get all these likes and follows and shares and stuff and that, that's that's the entirety of why you do what you're doing like you know, is it a vanity project or is it something more, something deeper? So this was a, this is a biased topic on my part because I'm, I do not look fondly on people that just simply, they do these things. It's, 
it's one thing to go on a vacation to get a break and get away. But if you're simply going to these places and like, look at me, look at me, snap, 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 look at me. And I've seen this. The entirety of people going to these temples and looking at things, it's just you only see them on their phone, just taking pictures of everything. And it's like, do you not just stand there? Do you not just, you know, it's fine taking a picture. It's fine taking pictures of yourself there, just not just to prove you've been there, but just so you can look back and hark back on the moment. But, you know, experience it. Take it in. Breathe the air that's there, you know. Touch the ground, you know. These things are real. They're tangible, you know. Why, why simply live, why be a voyeur and live through your phone looking at the reality of what you're looking at instead of, experiencing it right so it's it's a touchy topic in the sense of that it's just not something i look at with fondness but now reading from the excerpt itself the article itself our lives are surrounded by adventure escapist stories on the news in articles and now on social media constantly Pictures of beach bods lounging around on the sun-baked sand, standing on top of the pristine mountain mountainscapes, looking across the range to the simplest of places, showing off one's food or pet, you know. But what convinced us that these are what we consider as an adventure or travel or even an escape? Is it simply what society deems acceptable as a true adventure or escape? Or was it initially something more profound and daring? What originally captivated us into setting out into the questionable or the unknown? The true adventure, what was it? Now the adventure term is literally an unusual an exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity, which is to engage in a hazardous and exciting activity, especially the exploration of unknown territory. Now that's the true definition of adventure. Now with that definition in front, we know what the word means, but how has it drastically changed from its original intent or has it at all the word itself derives from the latin word adventurous meaning a thing about to happen adventure the word first appeared around the 1200s it referred to something that happened by luck or chance since its inception it's been adapted over time like all language taking on the meaning risk or danger in the 1300s a dangerous undertaking in the late 14th century and by the mid 1500s remarkable occurrence was added to its ever-growing roster of meanings words though change over time that is what language always does as we integrate diverse cultures together old words merge and morph assuming new meanings while others are altogether replaced with brand new ones Knowing the history of something, it gives us a good point of reference in our journey, but it doesn't give us an answer. It merely gives us a little guidance on our path. In our age of interconnectivity, with the breakdown of barriers and our ability to communicate in the real time with anyone on the globe, both traditional and social norms have altered. Now, the smallest ripples across the globe send tidal waves of change to the ends of the earth. In essence, our words are morphing to our new needs and our changing world. As of today, we associate the term adventure with people posting on Instagram or some other social media platform. We are creating an illusion of what adventure means, a new definition our daring escape from our contained and shortened reality. Our new worlds are contained in devices that fit neatly in the palms of our hands. Even reality is shortened to merely browsing the lives of others on social media feeds. The deciding factors. Any escape from the normality 
of our life is an adventure. It's not the meaning of the word or in what context it is used that matters in the grand scheme of it all. It is the action you take with it that's important. Be it a small excursion to a park, a hiking trip, a raft down a river, or even leap across the pond into a foreign land. An adventure is simply what you envision it to be. The moment someone influences your view is the moment the adventure begins to lose its you factor and thus its uniqueness it is your life after all how you choose to use it is entirely up to you so is how you adventure an adventure doesn't have to be something you've never done before or you are too scared to do only something that you may not do frequently or ever anymore discovery is the biggest aspect at the root of adventuring Finding something new about yourself is always a worthwhile endeavor. Whether it's something about to happen, a remarkable occurrence, an unusual activity, or even just hashtagging the word on a post, the adventure will be whatever you make of it. So honestly, make the best of it. Now, that's the conclusion of the whole think piece of my very first think piece, you guys. And gals. So I hope everyone enjoyed this podcast in the very first episode. And I look forward to presenting more of my upcoming Think Peace podcast to you in the future. So be sure to subscribe and follow me on all devices that you listen to podcasts on. So take care. <laughs>